Welcome to our asynchronous session and our lesson is all about seasons and daily temperatures. As you sit quietly watching this video lecture, you are part of a moving experience. Why? Because planet Earth is speeding around the sun at thousands of kilometers per hour while at the same time spinning on its axis. When we look down upon the North Pole, we see that the direction of spin is counterclockwise, meaning that we are moving toward the east at hundreds of kilometers per hour. We normally don't think in that way, but of course, this is what causes the moon the sun and stars to rise in the east and set in the west. It is these motions coupled with the fact that the earth is tilted on its axis that cause our seasons. Therefore, we will begin this lecture by examining how earth's motion and the sun's energy work together to produce temperature variations on a seasonal basis. And later, we will examine the temperature variations on a daily basis. For our overview, Ahrens and Henson said that Earth has seasons because Earth is tilted on its axis as it revolves around the sun. And the tilt of the Earth causes a seasonal variation in both the length of daylight and the intensity of the sunlight that reaches the surface. When the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun, the southern hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. Thus, longer hours of day and more intense sunlight will produce summer in the northern hemisphere while in the southern hemisphere, shorter daylight hours and less intense sunlight produce winter. In more local setting, Earth's inclination influences the amount of solar energy received on the north and the south side of a hill as well as around a home. Also, the daily variation in air temperature near Earth's surface is controlled mainly by the input of energy from the sun and the output of energy from the surface of the Earth. The surface air cools at night as long as heat output exceeds input. And when the air temperature in agricultural areas drops Two dangerously low readings, our fruit trees, grape vineyards can be protected from the cold by a variety of means from mixing the air to spraying the trees and vines with water. So with our learning objectives, at the end of this lecture, the students must be able to to familiarize and describe the different seasons occurring on Earth. Second, compare and contrast the local seasonal variations. Third, construct a table comparing different seasons and seasonal variations occurring on Earth and familiarize the different air temperature data and apply learned concept in real life situations. As your motivation, use the What I Know column to list the things you know about the topic. Then list the questions you have in What I Want to Find Out column. Note that there are no wrong answers on these two columns. And after finishing reading the module and at the same time, listening and watching this video lecture in the what i learned column list the things you learned and you use bullet for your answers and now 
let us commence on the lesson about seasons and the uh, temperature variation by means of knowing the occurrence of seasons. So the average distance from Earth to the Sun is about 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles. Because Earth's or orbit is an ellipse instead of a circle and is slightly off-center from the Sun, the actual distance from the Earth to the Sun varies during the year. So that means it is not constant that the, that the distance of the Earth in a year is the same. Earth comes closer to Sun in January and it is thus in July. Okay. So according to Arons and Henson, Earth revolves completely around the Sun in, a, in an elliptical path in about 365 days and 6 hours. So that is one year plus a leap day every four years in February. As Earth revolves around the Sun, it spins on its axis completing one spin in 24 hours, and that is one day. The average distance from Earth to the Sun is about 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles. So the average distance from the Earth to the Sun is 150 kilometers, and because Earth's orbit is an ellipse instead of a circle and is slightly off-center from the sun, the actual distance from the earth to the sun varies again during the year. Earth comes closer to the sun in January, about 147 million kilometers, and that is the, that in, it does in July, about 152 million kilometers. Now, the solar energy that strikes the Earth or the Earth's surface perpendicularly or direct or directly is much more intense than the solar energy that strikes the same surface at an angle. Think of a shining a flashlight on a straight at a wall. You get a small circular spot of light here. Now, tip the flashlight and notice how the spot of light spreads over a larger area here in this portion. So the same principle holds for the sunlight. Sunlight striking the earth at an angle spreads out and must heat a larger region than sunlight impinging directly on the earth. Everything else being equal, an area experiencing more direct solar rays will receive more heat than the same size area being struck by sunlight at an angle. In addition, the more the sun's rays are slanted from the perpendicular, the more atmosphere they must penetrate. And the more atmosphere they penetrate, the more they can be scattered and absorbed. As a consequence, when the sun is high in the sky, it can heat the ground to a much higher temperature than when it is low on the horizon. The second important factor determining how warm Earth's surface becomes is the length of time the sun shines each day. 
the number of daylight hours. More daylight hours, of course, mean that more energy is available from the sunlight. In a given location, more solar energy reaches Earth's surface on a clear, long day than on a day that is clear but much shorter. Thus, more surface heating takes place. From a casual observation, we know that summer days have more daylight than winter days, right? Also, the noontime summer sun is higher in the sky than is the noontime winter sun. But both of these events occur because our spinning planet is inclined on its axis or tilted on its axis as it revolves around the sun. As illustrated in this slide, the angle of tilt is about 23.5 degrees from the perpendicular drawn to the plane of Earth's orbit. Earth's axis points to the same direction in space all year long. That is why on one side of Earth's orbit, okay, on one side of its orbit in summer during June, okay, the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. On the other side of the Earth's orbit, in winter, during December, the northern hemisphere, notice, is tilted away from the sun. As the Earth revolves about the sun, okay, it is tilted on its axis by an angle, again, of 23.5 degrees. Always points to the same area in space. And thus, again, in June, when the northern hemisphere is tipped toward the sun or near the sun, more direct sunlight and long hours of daylight cause warmer weather than in December when the northern hemisphere is tipped away from the sun. So this, this diagram, of course, is not to scale. The timing of each solstice and equinox varies slightly from year to year. The exact date may be a day earlier or later than shown here, depending on your on our time zones. Now, in this figure, it shows how the sun would appear in the sky to an observer at various latitudes at different times of the year. During June, okay, so Earlier, we learned that the North Pole of the Sun rises above the horizon in March and stays above at the horizon for six months until September. Notice in this figure, the North Pole, even when the Sun is at its highest, okay, it is low in the sky, only 23.5 degrees above the horizon. Farther south at the Arctic Circle here, south at the Ar Arctic Circle, the sun is always fairly low in the sky, even in June when the sun stays above the horizon for 24 hours. 
in the middle latitudes here, in the middle latitudes, notice that in December, the sun rises in the southeast. Reaches its highest point at noon, only about 268 um, above the southern horizon, and sets in the southwest here. This apparent path produces little intense sunlight and short daylight hours. On the other hand, in June, the sun rises in the northeast, reaches a much higher position in the sky at noon, about 74 degrees above the, south, uh, the southern horizon, and sets on the northwest here. This apparent path across the sky produces more intense solar heating, longer daylight hours, and of course, warmer weather. Here, this one illustrates how the tilt of Earth influences the sun's apparent path across the sky at the Tropic of Cancer about 23.5 degrees. And here, in letter E, in the equator, it gives the same information for an observer at the equator. Remember that we have here the observers. Now, because of Earth's uh, travels more slowly when it is farther from the sun, it takes Earth a little more than seven days longer to travel from March 20 to September 22 than from September 22 to March 20. Again, because the Earth uh, Earth travels more slowly when it is farther from the sun here, farther from the sun. It takes Earth a little more than seven longer to travel, seven days longer to travel from March 20 to September 22 than it travels from September 22 to March 20. It's 186 days from March 20 to September 22, and it only have 179 days when it travels from September 22 to March 20. Now, occurrence of seasons in local seasonal variations. Higher temperatures usually mean greater rates of evaporation in slightly drier soil conditions. Because of higher temperature, it will um, increase the rate of evaporation of water and the result is drier soil condition. Because of that, south-facing hillsides are usually warmer and drier as compared to north-facing slopes at the same elevation because in the south facing hillside it usually uh, the sun strikes on that portion than on the north facing slopes in many areas of the earth only sparse vegetation will grow on south facing slopes while on the same hill Dense vegetation grows on the cooler, moister slopes than that face the north portion. Because, of course, of the available or avail availability of water for them to survive. In, north, in northern latitudes, 
Hillsides that face south usually have a longer growing season. Since air temperatures normally decrease with increasing height, trees found on the cooler north-facing side of the mountains are often those that usually grow at higher elevation, while the warmer south-facing side of the mountain often supports trees usually found at lower elevation. Now, what will be the application of air temperature data? So the heating degree day is based on the assumption that people will begin to use their furnaces when the mean daily temperature drops below 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And therefore, heating degree days are determined by subtracting the mean temperature to the day from 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And because of that, if the mean temperature of the day is 64 degrees Fahrenheit, then the heating degree day for this day is 1. The knowledge of the number of cooling degree days in an area will allow everybody or will allow builder to plan the size and the type of equipment that should be installed to provide adequate air conditioning for, for a comfortable um, area to live. Also, the forecasting of cooling degree days during summer will give power companies a way of predicting the energy demand during the peak energy periods. And also, farmers can use an index called growing degree days as a guide to planting and for determining the approximate days when a crop will be ready for harvesting. Now, how do we measure air temperature? Remember that thermometers were developed to measure air temperatures. Each thermometer has a definite scale and, it's cali and it is calibrated. A very common thermometer for measuring surface air temperature is the liquid in glass thermometer. So here... This type of thermometer has a bulb or glass bulb attached to a sealed graduated tube about 25 centimeters or 10 inches long. A very small opening or bore here extends from the bulb to the end of the tube. A liquid in the bulb, usually made up, uh, which usually with mercury or red colored, this one, an alcohol, is free to move from the bulb up through the bore into the tube. The length of the liquid in the tube represents the air temperature. So, a section of a maximum temperature here on the left. A section of minimum thermometer showing both current air temperature and the minimum temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Usually here in the Philippines, we use degrees Celsius. The maximum um, thermometer looks like any other liquid in glass thermometer with one exception. It has a small constriction within the bore just above the bulb. So as the air temperature increases, the mercury or the alcohol, okay, this one is the mercury, this one will be the alcohol. The mercury or the alcohol expands and freely moves past the constriction up the tube here. 
until the maximum temperature occurs. However, as the air temperature begins to drop, the small constriction prevents the mercury from flowing back into the bulb. And thus, the end of the stationary mercury column indicates the maximum temperature for the day. The mercury will stay at this position until either the air warms to a higher reading or the, th the thermometer is reset by whirling it on a special holder and pivot. Usually, the whirling is sufficient to push mercury back into the bulb past the con constriction until the end of the column will indicate the present air temperature. You can remember before we use the um, thermometer in checking our body temperature. And after we checked the temperature, we tend to whirl the thermometer, especially the, the mercury um, thermometer. A minimum thermometer measures the lowest temperature reached during a given period. Okay, here is the minimum temperature. Most minimum temperatures or minimum thermometers, I mean, use alcohol as a liquid since it freezes at a temperature of to 21 degrees compared to 23 degrees for mercury, the minimum thermometer is similar to other liquid in glass thermometers except that it contains a small barrel-shaped index in the bore here, index marker. The small index marker is free to slide back and forth within the liquid. It cannot move out of the liquid because of the surface tension at the end of the liquid column, wherein we can see here the meniscus. It holds it. Okay, The meniscus holds it. A minimum thermometer is mounted horizontally as the air temperature drops, the contracting liquid moves back into the bulb and brings the index marker down and bore when, with it. When the air temperature stops in decreasing, the liquid and the index marker stop moving down the bore into the bulb and brings the index marker down the bore with it. When the air temperature stop decreasing, the liquid and the index marker stop moving down to the bore. As the air warms, the alcohol expands and moves freely up the tube past the stationary index marker. Because the index marker does not move as the air warms, the minimum temperature is read by observing the upper end of the marker. To reset a minimum thermometer, simply tip it upside down and this will allow the index marker to slide to the upper end of the alcohol column. When... Uh, which is indicating the current air temperature. So this one. The thermometer is then remounted horizontally so that the marker will move toward the bulb as the air temperature decreases. Now, highly accurate temperature measurements can be made with electrical thermometers. Very accurate. One type of electrical thermometer is the electrical resistance thermometer. 
This does not directly measure air temperature, but rather, it measures the resistance of a wire, usually platinum or nickel, whose resistance increases as the temperature decreases. An electrical meter measures the resistance and is calibrated to represent air temperature. Electrical resistance thermometers are the type of thermometers used in the measurement of air temperature at more than 900 fully automated surface weather stations that exist at airports and military facilities throughout the United States. Because in the United States, they are more advanced than in the Philippines. And we all know that. So this one, the instrument that comprises the ASOS system. ASOS system is the uh, stands for Automated Surface Observing System. ASOS, again, Automated Surface Observing System. So the maximum and the minimum temperature shelters is the middle white box here. Thermistors are another type of electrical thermometer. It is made up of ceramic material whose resistance increases as the temperature decreases. A thermistor is the temperature measuring device of the radius uh, radio sode, the instrument, instrument that measures air temperature from the surface up to an altitude near 30 kilometers. Another, we have the thermocouple. It operates on the principle that the temperature difference between the junction of two dissimilar metals sets up a weak electrical current. When one end of the junction is maintained at a temperature different from that of the other end, an electrical current will flow in the circuit. This current is proportional to the temperature difference between the junctions. Air temperature can also be obtained with instruments called infrared sensors or radiometers. And radiometers do not measure the temperature directly, but rather they measure emitted radiation. And usually it is in the form of infrared. Remember that our cell phones before have infrared to transfer file from another cell phone to an from an from cell from one cell phone to another cell phone. I mean. Now we use Bluetooth. Measuring both the intensity of radiant energy and the wavelength of maximum emission of a particular gas, radiometers in orbiting satellites are now able to obtain temperature measures or measurements at selected levels in the atmosphere because it usually measures the emitted radiation. That's why it can measure um, the temperature in the Earth's surface. Here is the thermograph with a bimetallic thermometer. So a bimetallic thermometer consists of two different species of metal, usually brass and iron, usually uh, welded together to form a single strip. Here, the strip, metallic strip. As the temperature changes, the brass expands more than the iron, causing the strip to bend. So the small amount of bending is amplified through a system of levers here to a pointer on a calibrated scale. The bimetallic thermometer is usually the temperature sensing part that the thermograph, an instrument that measures and records the temperature. To summarize what we have discussed, the seasons are caused by Earth being tilted on its axis about 23.5 degrees as it revolves around the sun. Again, revolution is actually the movement of Earth around the sun. That's revolution. 
But when we are talking with uh, orbit, it actually rotates on its, uh, the Earth rotates on its orbit for 24 hours, or that is approximately one day. The tilt causes ma annual variation in the amount of sunlight that strikes the surface as well as variations in the length of time the sun shines at each latitude. During the day, Earth's surface and air above will continue to warm as long as incoming energy exceeds outgoing energy from the surface. Means the, the incoming energy from the sun exceeds on the energy or the heat that it dissipates from the surface going to outside of the Earth's atmosphere. At night, Earth's surface cools mainly by giving up more infrared radiation that it receives, a process called radiational cooling. So the coldest nights of winter normally occur when the air is calm, fairly dry, that means low water vapor content, and cloud-free. The highest temperatures during the day and the lowest temperatures at night are normally observed at Earth's surface. And radiation inversion exists usually at night when the air near the ground is colder than the air above. And lastly, farmers can use a variety of techniques to grow or to protect crops or fruit from damaging low temperatures, including the heat or the heating the air, mixing air, irrigating, and spraying water onto trees in below freezing weather. And I guess this will be the last slide. And thank you for your kind attention. Hope that you've gained knowledge, some knowledge about our lesson. And again, this video lecture is usually to augment with the module that has been uh, that had been uploaded already in our LMS. If you have questions and clarifications, you can uh, send your your queries in my email or in our group chat. So thank you very much. Have a nice day and continue learning.